Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Welcome, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing today? Good, Bruce. We actually have, like, not just imaginary NHL things to talk about, like possible future matchups of the Blackhawks and the Oilers. We actually have actual on-ice line combinations that the coaches have gone with, and we have the most up-to-date information on um, the injury health status of both teams. And this is something that I was quite worried about for some time. Um, I think the most, obviously, the closer you get to a complete lockdown bubble, the more likely it is there's going to be trouble with a player uh, getting sick or getting injured. So two fairly prominent players, one extremely prominent player on the Blackhawks, and um, one prominent, well, fairly prominent player on the Edmonton Oilers are both out with an undisclosed ailment. They are both listed as unfit to play. Of course, there's rampant speculation that both of the players have COVID-19, which is shouldn't be a stigma for anyone to say they have COVID-19. I don't know why the NHL treats it as as a secret, as a state secret. I just think it, it actually stigmatizes the disease in a way that it shouldn't be stigmatized and isn't really stigmatized. People will get this. They won't get it. What's the big deal? I don't know why they're keeping it secret like they are. Because, Bruce, in the absence of good information, there's bad, there's speculation and rumor, and there's already s- stupid talk on the internet about this, that, and the other thing around these players. So just, just, I just wish the NHL had a different policy. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Bruce, what does it mean? What, what do you, what was the tweet out of Chicago on Crawford? Yeah, I mean that that that, that policy, uh, it meant. I think the the. Uh, expectation of uh, privacy meant more in July when the players were on their own time. Like, I think Austin Matthews probably has still got a pretty good beef. But we're getting at the point where, you know, players on or off the ice. I mean, there's only a finite number of explanation. And when a guy disappears with no obvious injury, unfit to play, generally points the other way. And then anybody in terms of, if you don't know, the suspicion will turn to, He's got that, and I agree with you. It's you know there shouldn't be a stigma other than uh, uh, there is in some groups where you know people are 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 foolish about uh, uh, you know joining large crowds of people that you know aren't aren't uh, masked up and so on and exposing themselves. But I, I don't see how in an individual case you could jump to such a conclusion uh, about a player. So I wouldn't stigmatize it at all myself. Uh, Anyway, I, I agree, Bruce. Earlier on, it I can see the argument. Like, you know, if you might have, if it, you know, you crashed the NHL season single-handedly by having a lot of players get this, then every player who had gotten it in June might have been blamed, and that might have been a heavy weight for a player. You know, as it is now, I don't, I don't, I have no idea why they're doing this. I mean, you know, during the regular season, people get the flu, they get a cold, they get a concussion, they get an injury. Usually that kind of information for a normal citizen is private, but when you become a professional athlete and everyone's right. wondering if you're going to play and you're going to be 100%, you've given up that little bit of privacy that other people have, and it's it becomes general discussion. And it, it there's no stigma around it. getting any of those other things. I don't see why there would be about this. It's just, it's another, it's a, it's, it's another uh, illness. And there, it's just, uh, honestly, it's going to, make for very kind of awkward, like the, the media guys, they I think they might even feel awkward asking the question, does he have COVID-19? It's just an honest, mm-hmm. simple question should be answered in a factual and clinical way. And they're blow, they, the NHL and the NHLPA are blowing this out of proportion at this point by putting this huge kind of shroud of secrecy around what for these players is, what for these players is generally speaking, people this age, not a serious condition. If it was a serious condition, they shouldn't be playing, frankly. So they're, I don't know. I, I just think they're blowing it, it from a PR standpoint and um, probably in the best best of intentions, I guess. I don't know, but it's just it just makes no sense to me. Somebody raised the point that if, if the league is trying to get in good with the gambling industry, that by being less than forthcoming about uh, uh, unfitness to play uh, might not uh, go over all that well. Like, people need good information to, uh, to do that stuff. I mean... That's at least that seems to be the ideal. Not being a gambling man myself, I couldn't tell you thing one about the inside of it, but 
Isn't it, Bruce, uh, why the NFL has always had such exact reports? Doesn't the NFL, and I'm not an NFL fan, but I remember when I was, I remember just how exact the reports were, completely clear. You know, they'd have, if he's probable or likely, they'd have all these gradations, whether he's going to play or not, and exactly what the injury is. That was for the gamblers so they could place mm-hmm. their bets in, in, in a better manner. So yep. they gambling four, is... Four, four levels. If they reported on a guy, it was probable. Uh, that went all the way down to out, where the guy definitely wasn't playing. And then there was like a 75, 50, 25 percent chance. And they actually tracked it over time to say if the team said that the guy was doubtful and they listed 26 guys as being doubtful over the course of the season, then then, you know, 20 of them should have missed the game and six played or whatever, you know. And and over time, they can actually say, you know, that team is, you know, they haven't got their terminology straight. And then so they, uh, you know, because eventually, especially in football, you get like seven injuries a week. You could have, uh, you know, lots of uh, lots of cases where, so they could actually follow up and 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 statistically track uh, how honest those uh, those assessments were. But that's uh, that's fascinating. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah, so gambling is a big part of pro sports. Just a fact. That's another fact of the matter that might be uncomfortable for for people to talk about, but it's true. This is the twenty first century, David. Yeah, and gamblers need that information so that they're not serving that clientele very well either. But I just think it's just it just distorts conversation in a stupid way that it doesn't have to be distorted. Oh, can't I read we, some awful can't we crap talk this about morning any, about Caleb Jones already? Yeah, and I mean, can't we on. talk? Can't we talk about anything? Does everything have to be like you know? We're also we can't talk about a simple fact that someone's got a you know what for them is like a super bad cold. You know, generally speaking, for people in that age group. Or might even be asymptomatic. Most people are asymptomatic in that age group, I understand. So for them, it's not even that bad. So it just, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it. And it's bad. And if I was, and if they hired a, a PR expert, someone who really knew what they were doing, they'd say, this is just a really bad idea. You're, you're, you're going to cause more trouble for yourself than it's worth NHL and NHLPA. So, yeah. And I heard stupid stuff about Jones. Like, just sh- 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 shut your yaps. We don't. A, we don't even know if he has this disease. We don't. And B, how he got it, if he does have it, we have no idea about that either. And all kinds of young people are getting this disease. It's exploding all over the states. It's exploding. It's probably going to come in, you know, looking at what happened in Sylvan Lake this weekend. Expect it to explode in Alberta if people keep behaving that way. So, um, you know, there's a lot of people getting this disease. Let's, let's you know such is life right now so we can all do what we can to protect ourselves and hopefully people will behave responsibility but any one person shouldn't be picked on or beaten up because they got a they got a bad uh they got a you know they got COVID-19 all right Bruce Corey Crawford what are they saying in Chicago about this which we don't know about whether he has it or not but what's the what's the indication of how serious whatever his injury is how serious it is his injury or illness well, Mark Lazarus, who's a, who's a senior reporter for The Athletic, says, uh, reading the tea leaves, so take this for what it's worth. But Jeremy Calton, Hawks coach, didn't sound like a guy who's expecting to have Corey Crawford available anytime soon. Apparently they have Subban, Delia, Lankinen, and Tompkins all competing at, uh, at goalie. And that's Malcolm Subban. I'm not sure I could give you a first name on the other guys. I mean, it's a... Uh, it's a potpourri of guys down the organizational chain. You know, it's the same as an outsider looking at the Oilers and saying, well, they got uh, Rodrigue and, and Wells and, and Skinner, but I, I don't know their first names either. I mean, obviously, Malcolm Subban would be the favorite, the guy they got back in the Robin Leonard trade. Now is the time you think Chicago might be thinking, boy, it might have been a good idea to hold on to Robin Leonard, but... There's no point in second guessing this year's trade deadline based on what happened two weeks after the trade deadline. But uh, it's uh, anyway, Stan Bowman says, uh, quote, the way we are handling this is we're looking at the guys that are here and ready to play. And when Corey's in that group, then we can talk about Corey. It's a tough one to speculate on. And that's, uh, you know, that, so they, you know, they can't really talk about it other than he's unfit to play. Just makes for stilted conversations, if nothing else. Just with these weird conversations where you can't even say, well, you know, it's the general prognosis for this and he seems to have a mild case of it, blah, blah, blah. Like, right. Yeah. I can't remember Wells' name either on the Oilers. I could never remember that goalie's name. You know, uh-huh. and, and uh, uh, first name. You know, the funny thing is with Leonard Bruce is that uh-huh. uh, 
that really is their disadvantage. That really is for the for the teams that were the bubble teams that got into the play-ins that really didn't belong there. Probably, truth be told, uh-huh. that their their downfall might become because they traded away someone pretty good at the deadline, like Robin Leonard or uh, Garrett Gustafson, and they they could probably use those players right now. Yeah, and I'll I'll advise you that Blackhawks Twitter has uh, its moments of insanity as well. It's not just Oilers Twitter. In the uh, in the comments that uh, came after one of these things, I saw somebody uh, accusing Stan Bowman of not being fit to be a general manager in the National Hockey League. Three times Stanley Cup winning GM Stan Bowman. Just to, just... <laughs> well, we all have our best before yeah. date, I guess. <laughs> Stan, Stanley Glenn Bowman. He's got the greatest name in hockey. His first name is named after the cup. Seriously, like yeah. he was born the the summer after Scotty Bowman. His dad won his first cup, so he called his son Stanley. His middle name is Glenn after Glenn Hall, Mr. Goalie, the great Hall of Famer from Stony Plain, Alberta. And of course, his last name is the same as the greatest coach in NHL history. So I mean, he's got the he's got the pedigree, and I, uh, I mean, he's made mistakes. Stan Bowman has made mistakes, but to call him to be unfit to be an NHL GM is kind of going off the charts. Well, maybe they're mad, <laughs> mad about that Seabrook contract. <laughs> There's a few things to be mad about, but hey. Oh, for sure, with any team, three, right? Like, three cups, you know. You make a lot of decisions, right? And a lot of them are, a lot of them, some of them are about the chemistry of the team and like all these different factors, and it's really hard to figure it out and get it, get, get 100% on them. And <laughs> anyway, that's their problem. They can worry about Stan Bowman. We don't have to. Uh, Bruce, the orders have their lines out. And uh, I'll just I'll just I'll just read the lines and they get get reaction. So the first line was R and H McDavid and Cassian. The, mm-hmm. And these lines are very similar to what they had in the last game of the season, uh, except not for identical. one was not identical but similar. And the second line Athanasiu, Drysaddle and Yamamoto. Third line Ennis, Shayan and Archibald. Fourth line the big grind line that Tippett's talked about Neil, Kara and Chason. Negard was on the ice, Joachim Negard with Haas and Russell. And the sixth line, Benson, Marodi, and McLeod. What do you think of those lines, Bruce? What's what's your thought? Well, the fifth line, I mean, those are the same guys that were sitting out on game 71. Uh, and, of course, at that time, Negard was on the long-term injured reserve. But he was, uh, um, you know, they're pretty clear-cut to be line five uh, going in, I think. Um and I mean, we'll see how it goes, but it looks like that uh, uh, that fourth line, Kara and uh, Neil and Chason, might be a thing. And you know, they they serve a dual purpose because not only are they you know a big big bodied uh, fourth line, but all three guys specialize on one of the special teams, right? So That's both Chason playing. and Neil share the net front role on the power play, and and uh, Kara's been a key cog in the penalty kill all year. So whereas uh, Haas, Negard, Russell, uh, they played a lot of fourth line type minutes this year, but special teams wasn't really their bag. Yeah, that grind line uh, had good results in about 30 minutes of even strength play together. They were, I think they scored three goals for and none against, which is, a, but a mighty small sample size. They got on the shot clock, but they got, they got the goals. Yeah, it's hard to, oh. it's, I, we'll see how that line does. Like you can mm-hmm. see a, a speedy line. Uh, taking advantage of them, mm-hmm. um, I, I honestly, I don't like these lines. I, like Ken Holland came on the radio and said, "Well, we're you know we're trying things. We'll try things around." And and the, and as we all know, the lines of NHL coaches are written in sand on the beach. Like they they will be washed away tomorrow. We might see completely new lines. So I don't. I'm not gonna. But but I don't like these lines, Bruce. I don't. I'm gonna have to hear a mighty 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 convincing argument. For the Oilers, for, for for me to be happy with the Oilers not going with the dynamite line of Dreisaitl, Yamamoto, and Nugent Hopkins. I just don't know why you would not go with easily, easily the best line in the NHL over a significant sample size of games, two months of games. I think they, they had a goal for percentage of, if I'm not mistaken, 79, 79%. Yeah. And or 77 maybe it was over 70 for sure it was, it way, was one way of those two numbers and off the charts how can you i don't get it 
and if man, I saw one of the things someone was saying, well, you got to get FNSEO going. Well, you don't, it's not so important to get FNSEO going to me that you would break up that, that great line, honestly. Wow. Now you might be getting Connor McDavid going is a different issue though. So this might be all around spreading the wealth, right? Like if your two best wingers right now are Yamamoto and R and H, then maybe, maybe it's only fair to break them up. But, um, I'm not loving that. I'm not loving that idea. Although, you know, these lines could work well. I'm not saying they can't. I, I, I like Tyler Ennis better than a fan of CU based on the way both players played. Ennis just looks like a smarter uh, reader of the game. His offensive reads seem a little bit more precise. He's more able to fit in with other really high IQ offensive players, perhaps at this point, than a fan of CU does. So I, I'd rather see him on a top line. On the other hand, if you want to get off and see you going, uh, you could put him with dry saddle or you could put him with McDavid and leave the dynamite line alone. But uh, that's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get too hot and bothered about what Dave Tippett's doing in the first day of camp, uh, other than to say Dave Tippett knows a whole lot more about coaching and about the Edmonton Oilers <laughs> than I'm ever going to. So at a certain point, I will defer to his expertise. I mean, by all means, we can chat about it and uh, and have our commentary. But uh, I do have uh, a fair amount of trust in the, finally in the current uh, um, uh, management and coaching team that the Oilers have. That uh, you know they're making their decisions for the for reasons, and they're going to get more right than wrong. And they're not n- nobody ever is going to get them all right. Not even Stan Bowman gets them all right. I guess some of my deference towards NHL coaches and um, GMs for some reason was diminished during the decade of darkness. I don't know why that might have been, but I, I found that that, that def- deference, which I had quite, in a, quite a strong sense of it, actually, yeah. uh, at least a decade ago, kind of just, I don't know, up in smoke a little bit. But I take, I take your point well, and I, I agree that, you know, Dave Tippett and Ken Holland certainly have get the benefit of the doubt at the very least. And and a complete acknowledgement of their their hockey knowledge, their vastly superior hockey knowledge, and their complete insider knowledge of this team, which all of us utterly lack, and they they have in spades. So there's all these different reasons for doing things, and you're right. It's important to think about what are the different reasons that you might want to shuffle things up during training camp, at least try different things out, and it probably makes a lot of sense in training camp to maybe maybe they think FNSU's needs a little bit of hope coming into camp that he's not going to be forgotten on this team, right. that he yeah. could play a big role. So let's mm-hmm. give him that message on day one. Like you, you mm-hmm. could have a big role here, young man. And, uh, and, and he, here's proof of it. Here's tangible proof. You're on a line with Leon fricking dry the MVP to be of the NHL. So can't complain about that. Can you, maybe that's important well, for him. Yeah. And of course, yeah, the other, the other, underlying point is that August 1st is still a long way off, 19 days from now, before they actually drop the puck in anger. So let's go to the Chicago lines. The defense is not much to talk about there on the orders, but Chicago lines had some interesting things, and I wrote a post on it. So the the interesting thing to me is um, the coach uh, on this first day of camp, he, he also liked the Oilers, but even more so. He went with the lineup that he used in their last game of the season. And it's the exact same lineup, exact same line combinations, except one player got injured. I can't remember a fourth liner and is now out and someone else took that player's spot. But the interesting thing is at the end of the season, the Chicago coach certainly was shaking things up because the lines he ended up with was, was kind of a, a real experiment. Because these are people that hadn't played together uh, all year long very much. So the one line that, that we see, is, you know, they, they, for instance, they have three top scorers, Patrick Kane, Jonathan Caves, and Dominic Kubalik. Not one of them are on the same line right now. Um, they did play a substantial amount of time together in the regular season, um, at least paired up in different pairings. So the, one of the lines, Kubalik, Kirby Dock and Drake Kajula, a name familiar to all Oilers fans. They played together six minutes in the regular season. We have another line, Alex Dabrinkit, Jonathan Taves, and Brandon Saud. They played together 25 minutes in the regular season. The the fourth line of Ryan Carpenter, Kampf, and, and Highmore played together 54 minutes, which is about 
uh, five games for for that kind of line. And then the the the, the line that played together most of all was um, Nylander, Alexander Nylander, Dylan Dylan Strom, Dylan Strom, mm-hmm. and Patrick Kane. They played together 111 minutes. Now that's a, that's actually quite a sizable amount of time in today's NHL for a line to play together. Uh, that's that's about what uh, seven or eight games for a second right. line. So they played together enough that you could consider they're familiar with each other, but none of these other players really played together that much. And he's really kind of shaking things up and rolling the dice and continuing with his experiment. But again, could all change. But what do you make anything of his? Well, I'd be keen, and this is something that can be verified, but I, I for one, haven't done it yet, to, to see how many of these guys played together as tandems. Like, it's very possible Jonathan Taze played a stack of time with the Hawks to bring Cat and another stack a different time with Brandon Saad, but never with the two of them on his line. But, the, you know, there's a, a degree of fam- familiarity among them that'll come pretty quick. Uh, and otherwise, it's, you know, like you say, day one to camp, and they just pick up where the season dropped off. Let's start with where, where we ended, and then let's let's move from there. So... I'm, again, not really putting a whole lot of stock in it, other than to say they have a lot of talent in Chicago's top nine. They there's, do. There's, I mean, some of these guys are young and maybe not ready for prime time, fully ready for playoff prime time yet, like uh, Kirby Doc, Alex Nylander, Dylan Strome, to name three. Um, but uh, the, there's a lot of goal-scoring talent on that uh on that team, and it's uh, however they put them together, they're going to be, uh, you know, they're going to be dangerous. Well, here's one for you, Bruce. Jonathan Taves and Alex DeBrinket did play together quite a bit this year, and mm-hmm. they're on the same. They played 174 even strength minutes okay. together. They scored uh, the the Blackhawks scored six goals and gave up 14. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then Taves Taves and Brandon Saad also played together a lot, 402 minutes together. Uh-huh. The Blackhawks scored 23 goals and gave up 27. So um, you're, you're kind of betting against the odds going with the Brinkett, Taves, and Saad, and maybe you're hoping that the that the trends that, where they got outscored considerably um, won't hold in the playoffs. And they could easily not hold. These are they they could easily find some chemistry, get it together, and play really well together. And and uh, that's the thing about lines. But you know what, Bruce? Do you find I, I always find that like either players have that chemistry or they don't. Like you can usually tell within a couple games whether a line's gonna come mm-hmm. together or not. Like if, if the players do work together, you can you, it's there's a little bit of magic there, and you see it almost immediately. Sometimes they lose it, but usually it's pretty evident. So I hope they've got the wrong lines in Chicago. I hope they've got it all screwed up. <laughs> but well, one yeah. thing's for sure: Ryan Carpenter, David Camp, and Matthew Highmore is a fourth line. And they're actually, yes. uh, I don't know much about Highmore, but I know Carpenter and Camp have got a, uh, some experience as kind of shutdown type players. Yeah. And I guess that's what you want, but you don't expect them to score many goals. Yeah. So who do they have? Let's look at their defense here. They have Duncan Keith and Adam Boquist on one pairing. So a rookie, and I think he's 20 now, and mm-hmm. the veteran who's uh, 30. Two. Oh, Keith's 34, 35. Yeah, he's older. Yeah. <clears throat> That's right. They have, he was Calvin, they have Calvin DeHaan, who's back from injury, with Connor Murphy on their second pairing. That's a f- solid veteran pairing. And then on the third pairing is Oli Mata and Slater Cuckoo. And um, their, fi- their fourth pairing, Lucas Carlson and Brent Seabrook. So, um, yeah, it's a, this is a very – this is a good team. It's not it's, – it's uh, this is a scary – this is the team – that in, in a different in a incarnation five years ago was deemed by Scotty Bowman one of the eight best teams in NHL history. And mm-hmm. there's players sure. from this there's players from this team who are still in their prime and are still from that team. So I would say Taves and both Taves and um and Kane are still and Brandon Sod, they're all in their prime. They're all from that team. So there's you know there's some really, really good hockey players. Um, who who can help this team? Corey Crawford, who can help this team right now in this playoffs against the Oilers? It's going to be a it's going to be a very nerve wracking series. It's not going to be any kind of cakewalk. Uh, even though I do think 
personally the Oilers are going to win. I would say Oilers in uh, four would be my initial bet. Are you looking up Duncan Keith Sage? No, I'm looking up the <laughs> the combination that once showed up on the bench for the uh, uh, for the Tampa Bay Lightning when they had Slater Kukuk. And I, oh, this was in, I think, probably training camp one year, and they had the draft pick, Boris Kachuk. And they had the two of them sitting right next to each other on the be- bench, and the name bar is read Kukuk Kachuk. <laughs> This tweet, is Robinson. <laughs> tweet, 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 Tommaso. <laughs> All right, yeah. I'm just checking, Bruce. Have we I covered am the every- Eggman. I'm the walrus. Cuckoo, cuckoo. Something like that. I never did understand the word or what it meant, but. Uh... <laughs> Didn't they say cuckoo, cuckoo, not cuckoo, like as in Mac cuckoo? Um, all right. I'm just checking the checking the Twitter to see if there's anything else, any other news. Did we miss anything, Bruce? Anything newsworthy? Did you listen to that I press conference? So. Bruce? I did, yeah, I watched the media conference and and uh, it it held my attention for seconds on end. And <laughs> it, man, it was it was boring. It was so sterile the environment. Was they had they, they had like five minute wait between guys with this terrible music. Then they have a guy on the stage with a uh, with a baseball hat, and asking reporters one by one to ask one question each, and they had to remind the reporters, you know, to turn on the microphones and stuff. I mean, it's I mean it's all new to everybody how they're going about doing it. And uh, you and I can speak from from firsthand experience that some of this technology is doesn't come easily to some of us, especially uh, folks that have been around that remember the 20th century. Let's put it that way. And yeah. so there was a, there was a few uh, uh, a few missteps along the way, but more to the point, the, the the questions weren't particularly probing, and the answers were dull as dishwash. Well, well almost, you know, the players did what the players do, and there was no sort of chance to follow up. To, you know, I think I saw two smiles. Somebody asked uh, Cassian about his mutton chops, and he smiled on that, and. Uh, I think Tip, Tippett had a small smile at one point, but it was otherwise just stony face, answer the question, wait, wait, listen for, you know, and the other thing, of course, for about the presser uh, is before you can ask the question, you have to have the moderator speak in to say who's going to be able to ask the next question, remind them to use their mic, and everything just seemed to be slow down and kind of stilted. And hopefully they're all going to, including the players, hopefully, all going to get better and a little bit more fluid at this process. Um, but I, 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 I'm frankly a little concerned about about how um, visceral the coverage is ever going to be. And of course, the fact the Oilers are themselves so sort of controlling this press conference and putting it out on their media channel adds that extra layer of... of um, <clears throat> What's the word? Just you know, control of the of the message. Yeah. And then getting I mean, their having their media guys ask questions. I mean, let their mm-hmm. they can't they ask questions whenever they want. Let the other reporters ask the questions. Like, do we need the question from the team PR guy at that moment? Sorry. And how about this? Just just a, just a thought. Set up two mics. You know, so mm-hmm. one in one area and another. So if you, so you can move seamlessly between player to player so you don't have that five minute gap i mean when hinshaw hinshaw the alberta's chief medical officer they're, they're all standing there socially distanced the three or four people who are going to be interviewed and the, then you can say hey i'd like to ask so and so the question so they're right there you just pull them on up and this is the chief it can't be that dangerous and risky if hinshaw's doing it why not have the four people in the room standing there socially distanced hey i'd like to talk to you so so then you're the reporter you get to ask a question you're mm-hmm. in you you're in the queue to ask a question and you actually get to pick the person who you want to ask that you actually need to ask right. so i think they can this is listen anyone who's listened to this podcast knows that we are the last people who who have major you know can throw stones because we have the biggest glass house i mean our sound quality has been terrible our audio quality has been terrible. On you know, occasion, we, but yes. Yes. We've, we've always had our foibles, for sure. And, and, our, <laughs> uh, and our, our, yeah, our, our technical uh, glitches. So 
I get it. It's they're working out the bugs here. So this is my suggestion to do either like socially distance the people who are going to be asked questions in the room. If that's not possible, please set up two or three stations then so you can move in the press conference seamlessly from player to player to player. How much more would it cost to set up a one more station where you could have three stations where three different players are sitting there and then you could pick which one you want to ask the question of. It's not going to be a massive cost and it will make your press conference a lot more interesting. I got the impression that each guy was asking questions through his own computer or laptop as opposed to any kind of standardized mic or anything, just like oh, you, you and I are talking now. Yeah, the reporters like, were, but like, you could have the, the, oh, the players. The players, the players yes. can be at different gotcha. stations in the oil, so you don't have to wait for the next guy. And so, if you have, let's say, let's say it's Ryan Nugent Hopkins up there, but you don't have a question for him, you you want to ask McDavid a question, so he should be at the other desk with the other microphone, so you could actually just easily go to McDavid as opposed to ask R and H. Yeah, of course, the worry is then you could have five players up there and all the questions could be for one guy because he's got a little higher profile than the others. We've seen press conferences like that where the questions over and over again go to one central person. Such is so, life. No perfect I, answer. I'm not worried about that. I, I mean, I just honestly, I don't really... The players, I don't, I can't remember the last time a player said something that really got my attention. Maybe it happens now and then. I, I want to see a, a lengthy interview with Dave Tippett um that's what i want to see uh where, where someone can actually ask him without feeling like they're a fiend whether a player has covid or not right. and get an get an just a clinical fair answer not no big deal that would be my ideal for this situation but uh, it's probably asking way too much so yeah different times all righty bruce well we're back the others are back yeah, they're on the ice. I mean, this is a this is a significant step forward. There was I mean, not that we could could hear. I saw a little bit of footage from on high of what was scrimmage, but uh, the, to me, the, this is a hockey season. Every hockey season is that first time that I go in the rink and I can hear the smash of sticks on pucks and pucks on boards and skates digging into the ice. And we're not quite there yet. I'm not sure when we're going to get into the place where you can hear it with your own ears, but uh, they're on the ice, and you know, hockey season is afoot. It's ser we're seriously uh, um, taking an important step to phase three, and now it's uh, hang on, Harvey, and see if we can get to phase four. Yeah, you know, I've been. Oh, I just checked the score here of um, Manchester United's game. Um, I'm a Manchester United fan, and I've been watching some of their games, highlights from their games, uh, without fans in the stands. And I have to say, the intensity of the game seemed very high. The quality of the play after the first game has seemed really super high. I've liked everything about it. I mean, I think it's better when you have the fans singing the terraces. And it, sure, that adds something to it. But it's actually been very, the games themselves have been really hard fought and, and interesting and intense. So uh, I expect hockey will be the same way, but we won't know till we see it. Yeah, I saw a little bit. I saw one game with the fake crowd noise. Yeah, did and you like that? Uh, well, it sounded okay while the play was sort of generally underway, but then when something actually really happened and, you know, they scored a goal and it just still sounded like the crowd was murmuring among themselves <laughs> as if they were playing ticky-tacky out of midfield, you know, without, you know, and the ball went in the net and there was just, there was no delta in the crowd noise. It just kept doing the same. So that immediately exposed, exposed it as being ultra fake and unreliable. Like crowd noise is a language in its own right. I, I learned a lot about hockey uh, and about French, listening to French radio broadcasts in my youth and letting the crowd noise tell me a lot about what was going on on the ice when I didn't understand the uh, the exact words of the announcers. But you can you can you can tell the difference between a close chance on the, against the home team's goalie versus a close chance on the away team's goalie just by the way the crowd reacts to that that uh, that opportunity and you know there's 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 lots of uh, subtle and not so subtle clues in there and if it's all p pumped in then it's you know it's basically a laugh track without any context so you know laugh tracks work that's why they use them and I think that if they used a, a, I think if they used a, um, yeah, they don't have them in movies, of course, right? Uh -huh. So they use them in sitcoms. But I think if they had a more sophisticated, 
most almost <laughs> every sitcom. Um, I'm not. Nash, I don't, Nash got better when they got rid of the laugh track. There, that's my, that's my uh, closing argument. Seinfeld <laughs> Seinfeld had no laugh track. That's your closing argument. Live audience um, laughter. Yeah, different different altogether. It's real. It's reactive. So, if they're going to do it, they better do it well, I would suggest. Like, don't just, like, have, address the issue that you're talking about. I didn't, I heard it. I didn't mind it. I thought it was okay. Like, it doesn't bother me one way or the other. I'm just, I'm just, I like watching the play. I like watching the players. Oh, and, and um, look, I'm engrossed in that as much as anything. So, I don't know about uh, miking the players and, and, like, hearing what they say on the ice. That could be, when tempers start getting out of control, you could be opening up a huge can of worms uh, with some of the language that's going to come out of people's mouths. Don't so put, don't put a mic on Bobby Clark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't put a mic on Bobby Clark. One of the you don't like Bobby Clark. In, one of the more infamous uh, uh, soundtrack episodes in uh, in uh, TV history was Bobby Clark, and well, it wouldn't would have been sometime around 1980 or thereabouts. Obviously, just given his era, where he let fly with a stream of invective that. Included some not to be heard on TV words, and also some uh, a word or two impugning the character of the other player. I won't go any further than that, other than to say to this, you know, twenty-ish guy watching it, I was like, "Holy! Did I just hear what I thought I heard?" You know, and and there was some some blowback from that. Nowadays, you get the f bomb, you know, a few times a game. You just you know, it's just part of the game. It's but but more, it's more of the it's not even the cursing, it's more the, you know, some of the things that might be said in the heat of the moment that that carry a little bit more of a of a, uh, a message that they would prefer not be delivered to a wide audience. So I think it will be interesting to see how they how they try and control that. Like you're going to hear more um, sounds from the players because you don't have the crowd noise and asking it. I think they're going to have the, the the smart NHL teams will have some media training where they teach the players to go full Battlestar Galactica, and and you're allowed to say you're allowed to say, hey you fracking frack face, get mm -hmm. out of my fracking way or mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, that would be the smart play from an NHL team because they're going to have to blow steam on the ice somehow. I think they're too used to it not to do that. All right, Bruce, let's leave it there. All Thanks right. for talking. All right, thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. Let's find the off button.